That was wonderful playing. And um, what, what the first thing to say is that I'm going to talk about a few of the Boeings, but the Boeings you do are very plausible. Um, and uh, I'm reminded my teacher, Gregor Piedagorski, used to say, um, never play for the cellists in the audience. They always have a different idea, <laughs> you know. So uh, you're, uh, there are a lot of cellists here today, and the thing is simply that we're just here to to share some ideas and not claim ownership or certainty about them. We can't. So um, the first thing I will want to talk about in the prelude, which is a kind of a fantasy, right? Uh, I'd like to show, Hank, can we show the manuscript of, of, the, of the opening page of that? Let's, oh, well, okay, so this is, the, by the way, this is the manuscript of the Magda, Anna Magdalena copy. And it says here, six uh, suites for solo cello with eight without bass, composed by Signor J.S. Bach, Maître de Chapelle. Now, so that, by that point, he was working in Leipzig, clearly. That's kind of proof of that. Let's go on one page now to the first page of the D minor suite. Can we get that? OK. OK, here we are. Now, I've got uh, this nice fancy little machine here. It's called a laser. Oh, that's, yeah, that's it. OK. And let's see whether it works. Yes, OK, it worked already. OK, so, no, that's the wrong, oh, or it starts down here. OK, so. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the, uh, in the Anna Magdalena manuscript. Where do the slurs begin? Where do they end? Did she really know anything about Boeing? People will say the one very standard thing is, well, just throw it out and thank her for the notes because she didn't know what she was doing. <laughs> now, I think that's very short-sighted, although I think that uh, the first thing to say is that this kind of bow, can I take your bow for a second? Just okay. This is what we call a French bow. And this was not invented, this shape of bow, until about 1790. So Bach died in 1750. So we're playing on an instrument that is more or less the same, except we have different kinds of strings and a longer fingerboard and things like that. But it's still, there was such a thing as a cello that resembled very much what we're playing on now. And uh, but the bow is completely different. And so when we're talking about bowing, we've got a little bit the dilemma, well, would you do the bowings that are there with a French bow? And I don't know the answer to that question. By the time we're done today, everybody's going to go away saying, I'm more confused than we, when we began. But you know, you're lucky. I've been confused for more than 60 years <laughs> on this topic, and it's not over yet. Okay, anyway, what I would like you to look, you can look at your score, you can turn around and look. I'd like to look with you here. So, that's pretty clear, right? Ya -da -da, ba -da -da. Now, what, what's going on here? You see, you could say, oh well, her pen was not very, accurate and so it's a four note slur.
but you could also say it's 1 plus 3. And these are separate. And this could look like 1 plus 3. And this looks like 4. And this looks like 4. OK, but here, again, ya pa da 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 ya pa da 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 So if she could get it right in some of the places, possibly that's right, too? Had you ever thought about that? OK, so anyway. Um, Let's, let's try it and see just what we get out of that. So let me put this aside and come over a little bit closer. So can you try it first of all? See if you could do threes in some of those places. And let's talk, let's have a discussion about that. asking you to do all of Anna Magdalene's things. I'm just mostly talking about that because, uh, well, one thing I want to say is that the reason that I think that cellists should have a copy of the violin manuscript is because in the violin manuscript, Bach was a really good violin player. We know that. And in this period of his life when he wrote them, he was writing them for himself to play. And when he finally made this clean copy in 1720, he knew what he wanted. And so if you look very carefully at the violinist, if you show that copy and put it in front of a the violinist, they can play what's on that page without changing anything. Doesn't mean they're going to. They might have some different ideas. But they could play exactly what he wrote. And one thing that I notice very much in the Bach violin manuscript is that when he has a sequential figure, he keeps the same bowings. So once he establishes the character of some kind of a shape, he uses the same bowings. Now, what's hard about Anna Magdalena is that they are irregular, and so you don't know what to do. But what I'm saying is if you would, I mean, when you have <laughs> something like that, you're not, by common sense, you're going to, not going to do it. But at the beginning, I think it's worth having a discussion with yourself about whether to do the theme Just do that, this, that one little element when it comes. Okay, fine. So, and you can fool around with that. I mean, I, well, we don't have, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to throw a bunch of ideas out today. And we don't have time really to follow them through. But they might be interesting for each of you individually, as cellists and whoever cellists are here or watching, to try some of these things. OK, now, it is true that a prelude is not a dance. Prelude means literally, and preludio means before the game. Ludus means game in Latin. And so it's before the game begins. The game is a bunch of dances, all, by the way, from different, each one from a different country, which uh, we'll get into as the afternoon goes on. So, but what I would say is seems a good idea in playing Bach is to have a regular meter going. And when you stop, uh, too strong a word is wantonly, but kind of uh, just because you feel like it here and there. 
because you're playing alone, you know, you never have to worry about being with somebody else, so they don't have to worry about being with you. But if you could have a sense of meter going along, I think that particularly if you do the one plus three, that it won't sound so um, strange. Can you start at the beginning and just try and pick your tempo and see if you can stick to it? You see, I hear... Play with me. Not so this is an example of where in the violin things you will see you've got a sequential figure. The bowing will stay the same in a sequential figure that he does it. So go from there. You, you, you go. There's so many stops. Okay, this is a, this is, everybody who plays these pieces has their pet little things. So, here. about the bowling. Just show the, the triad. Okay, fine, okay, fine. Okay, so that's the first point. Now the second thing is that when you come to places like uh, you play that bowling because that seems the only practical thing to do. But actually, there is a source from which we can learn something. And so I'm trying to make comments that are, you can take home everybody, or if you're at home, you'll look at them. At the end of Bach's life, he went to visit his son in a suburb of what is now, uh, what is now a suburb of Berlin called Potsdam. And Potsdam was the site of the court of a great king, Frederick the Great and very, very great music lover. And the reason Bach's son, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, was there was because um, he, the king, had an orchestra, a band, a group of musicians, whatever. And he named Carl Philipp Emanuel the, the boss of it. And so the, the thing probably called, well, you know, my father's a very good composer. Wouldn't you like to meet him? And however that happened. And then the, 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 um, we have the, uh, the reference at that time that said, about when he arrived, he said, old Bach has arrived. Old Bach. Okay. Anyway, he came there, and the very famous thing that happened was that the king said, the king played the flute, by the way. The king said, okay, I just composed this theme, you know, and I wonder whether you could improvise a fugue on it. Well, he 
he did. Three-part fugue. And then the king said, that's awfully good, Herr Bach. Could you improvise a six-part fugue on it? And Bach said, uh, your majesty, that's something worth doing, but I think I'd need a little time to think about that. So I'll take that home with me as homework. You know. And so he did that. And when he got home, he wrote a whole collection of music based on that theme. Uh, Richer Carr, which is an old-fashioned name for fugues, and uh, counterpoints and all of that, including a magnificent trio sonata for flute, violin, continuo cello, and harpsichord, and in which every movement of which has a quotation of that theme. So he used it very well. So anyway, the point I'm getting at for the, this Boeing here, I'm a little long-winded, and I'll try and get to my point quicker as I go on today is that Frederick the Great played the flute. And he had a flute teacher, of course. He, he hired a full-time flute teacher. The teacher's name was Johann Joachim Quantz, Q-U-A-N-T-Z. Flute players know the name Quantz because he wrote a lot of music for, for flute. But also in, 18, in 1753, which is only three or four years later, three years after Bach died, Quantz published a big volume, Suggestions About How to Play Music. It was, a, it, was a, it was a instruction book. And there's one section in there when, although it's, it's flute, there still is the question is, when do you play things legato and when do you separate them? And it's pretty heavy reading, you know, but it's available in English. And I recommend you to look at it. So a couple of things that I took out of that. When you have something that is in scale fashion, up to you. You might want to make it separate. You might want to make it connected. Same thing about arpeggios, notes in the same chord. But the one thing that's very interesting is that when you have a note followed by a leap and then notes like scale, you never collect, connect the leap. It's always separate. So when you have right there what I, uh, you would never go. And I think that's pretty good. I mean, there's a connection of this flutist who was in the room when Bach was there, and it was the music of the time. And I think there are things to learn from that. So I'm saying you did that. We do that mostly. And I think that's just fine. But I'm just validating that while we do it, uh, it was already considered a good thing to do at that time. And a lot of the Boeings are therefore written that way. So what else is there to talk about in the prelude? Um, you did something very, very good, and I'd like you to play it for everybody. Uh, we can go to the next page, Hank. Um, where is that? Oh, yeah, can you start back there? From the beginning. No, 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 I mean before there, anywhere around here. Anywhere, I want you to be before that, somewhere around here. I'm not sure what it is. Anywhere, just play. Okay. Just play. I'll play. Okay, what you did is something that Casals talked about. Casals is kind of our, our important figure in Bach because he's the person that really painted it. He said, when the line goes down, get softer. And you did that. I thought it was very effective. And then when the line goes up, you rise and you have more intensity. Okay, the last thing to say about the prelude is the very end of it. Well, you have this series of chords. Um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that in that case, Bach was saying, look, do something. <laughs> do something. Don't just play chords. You can, you can figure out whatever you want. And you know, everybody comes up with their own version of that something. The kind of something that I don't like is the one that sounds like more 12 notes in a bar. So when you come out, uh, uh, um, instead of, you 
you could do something. I mean, there are any number of things you could do, but think of doing something. Okay, turn the page. Now we'll go to the Alamont. Okay, uh, can we go to the next? Okay, so what is an Alamont? Uh, it's a German dance. That, uh, um, why is it a German dance? Uh, it, I, I think it, uh, it is. <laughs> 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 <Sorry. laughs> it's the French word that means German. Okay. Now, I think there's something really fascinating about Allemands in that this is a French suite. All the titles are in French, and he wrote pieces for keyboard that are called French suites. And this is kind of interesting, you know, because. This is a German dance, and he's writing a French suite, which is the French would write, including a movement from Germany. So I always have thought that this is the chance for Bach to write something that represents what he wants the French to think the Germans are. <laughs> the French and the Germans have not always gotten a very, had a very good relationship. I think these days it's better. But um, so, my attitude about it is a little bit like you listen to a Mozart opera like Marriage of Figaro, in which uh, there is a character, a young man, sung by a woman. OK, so I imagine now that this is a dance that is written by a German composer who's pretending he's French writing a German piece. Okay, double cross dressing, if you want to call it that. Okay, so what does he want people to think Germans are? Smart, organized, serious, reliable, all those kinds of things. So the first thing you need to do is to establish that it's a German dance. And a uh, very, very robust. So. The second time through, you played that bowing. But once you do it, can you establish it so that every time you come back in the movement, that you do that same bowing? So it's recognizable as the German cadence. OK. Um, now, the next thing that I want to talk about is just one more thing. Um, let's go to one more page, OK? OK. So you've got now, I'd like you to play from them here and just stop right there, okay, after those four notes. I actually don't have that second page of it. Um, with no, the I, script, but I have no, I mean, I want you to play, oh. I want you to play from here the second half of the piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> you see, what that four notes are is, this is horizontal music. This is music that is not, there are chords that occur here and there, but when you have put out, you know, uh, so it's a cadence. So look what he's done now. He's saying, you know, we Germans are so clever. We can write a cadence, not on the downbeat, but we can write it on the third beat of the bar. And you will find when you go through here, here's another one. There's three or four of them in the second half there, where the cadence occurs in the middle of the bar. And that's kind of just Bach saying, well, you know, we, we're, we're very smart. We know how to do these things. We don't have to do it always like a jig, you know, is very whatever, square. So I would suggest that when you come to that, take a little time. <laughs> I mean, you have to finish. 
figure out how to do it so that it doesn't do, pull the music apart. Good. Good. Okay. Now, good but not good. I don't have more time. So, anyway, that's a taste a little bit of a prelude and an element, and thank you very much for your wonderful playing.